Thanks very much uh, for that very kind introduction and uh, thanks very much for inviting me out here. It's really quite an honor to come back. Uh, uh, when I was once a, an undergraduate here, I could never have imagined coming and speaking in front of a, such a large group of the public. And actually, this is the largest group I've uh, spoken to. So uh, I hope it's not the last time. <laughs> now, if we look back at 2008, there were a lot of quite interesting things that happened. Of course, uh, uh, Obama was elected. Of course, there was a financial crisis we don't want to think about. But in science, something that was amazing was the interest, the growing interest in particle physics. And actually, for a while, the Large Hadron Collider was more popular than Obama. So <laughs> we really appreciate your interest in science. So particle physics, well, we try and connect the large and the small. So we're trying to bring the particles that actually make up the universe. We ask the basic questions like, what is the universe made of? And what are the forces that hold it together? So here you see a model of our understanding of how the universe began in a, in a big bang, and then a very rapid inflation, and then an expansion. Of course, people, astronomers and cosmologists, can say quite a lot about this. And in particle physics, we can try and answer some of the questions of how this happened. What are the particles that were, were being created uh, or being produced in the Big Bang? And what are the forces that were involved? And what's interesting is we can also go back in time over the 13, roughly 13 billion years of the universe. We can go down to something like, well, if you look in the power of 10, uh, a billionth of a second or tens of billionths of a second. So really, it's quite a, in a way, it's also a bit like a time machine when you look at an accelerator. So what is the universe made of? Well, if we looked back something a few, say, 1,000 BC, people would have said, well, it's what we can see. It's made of fire. It's made of earth. It's made of air. It's made of water. That's it. Those are the, the four elements and maybe the ether. Um, then, of course, the first ideas came, well, maybe there's something that's, that's indivisible. Maybe there's something like an atom. Uh, for example, Democritus is famous for that. But it was really only in the last hundred years that we started to really understand the atom, that we could imagine not just some little, little uh, vaguely defined blob, but really something with electrons orbiting around mostly empty space and then a tiny little core of a nucleus. And the example is the atom is something like one, one millionth of a strand of a hair. And just to give you this idea, if you were to take a ping pong ball and place it here, and say that's the nucleus of the atom, the electron would be orbiting somewhere in Dundas, and most of that then would be empty space and Coots Paradise in between. So that gives you the idea that we're actually mostly empty space. So then we first learned about this, this atom and the core, and then approaching today, about 70 years ago, we started to learn about the nucleus. It's actually made up of uh, elements of a proton and a neutron. And then we go deeper in the scale, about 40 years ago, we learned that there's actually something inside the proton and the neutron, the quarks. And there's actually a highlight here. There's a Canadian that was involved in this, uh, Dick Taylor, uh, with uh, other, uh, other Americans. He was actually awarded a Nobel Prize for the discovery of quarks at an accelerator. So that is, uh, as far as we know, that's the limit of uh, the deepest scale we can probe in an accelerator. And that's where we are today that quarks are the limit of, of matter, quarks, and then electrons. You can actually build everything up uh, that we know in the universe. We think they're point-like, and we put this together in something we call the standard model of particle physics that we'll hear more about. So this is the standard model of particle physics. We talked about the quarks. So there is an up quark and a down quark, and that's what makes up the proton. Well, it's actually two up and a down quark. Uh, they're different in their charge. Um, but that's all you need. You can make up all of the matter that we are, all of the, the matter plus an electron that makes up everything we can see in this room, all the stars, uh, well, almost all the stars, everything you can see in the universe. But, uh, okay, and there's one other element that actually is a partner to the electron, and that's a neutrino, which you may have heard of is this uh, almost massless particle that can, you know, penetrate kilometers of lead uh, without interacting. That's uh, something that uh, has been detected in Canada, for example, the Snow Lab experiment, uh, neutrinos. So this is the first generation, as it's called, of quarks and, well, leptons for the name light. 
uh, that exist in the standard model. But what was surprising is there's actually a second generation and a more massive generation that is not found in nature. You can find it in an accelerator. You can produce it. There's a charm quark and a strange quark. We don't really know why those that second generation exists, but it does. You can produce it in an accelerator, it decays. And there's also a partner to the electron, uh, which is a muon, and that we can observe in cosmic rays. And there's also a muon neutrino. And if that wasn't enough, there's a third family. There's the top quark and the bottom quark. Now these are much more massive. And there's also uh, another partner to the electron, the tau and the tau neutrino. So that's it, as far as we know, those are all the particles of matter that exist, the three families as we call them. Again, everything that we know is made up of these light quarks, but in an accelerator or let's say going back to the Big Bang, you could produce these heavy quarks. But we don't really know why they're there. So one thing we do know is that there are only three families. So this is data uh, Cliff Burgess mentioned earlier, the LEP accelerator, which was an electron-positron accelerator at CERN. And you can see three different curves. This is data uh, that was measured at LEP. And you see two families, three families, and four families. And the data, these little, little black points, very clearly lie that the answer that there are only three families of quarks and leptons. So we know from uh, the measurements we can do in an accelerator that there are three families. Well, it's actually 2.98 is the number, but it's, it's more or less three. So that is, that is the standard model of what the universe is made of. But what gives them their mass? You remember I talked about this top quark being very, very massive. So here you see a little scale of the six quarks and their masses. So there's a little up quark, which is what's in the proton together with the down quark. And it weighs almost nothing. On this scale, a proton mass would be one GV. Uh, and then you go along, and the charm and bottom quark are heavier, and this top quark is 175 times a proton mass. So this is some huge uh, colossus, and we don't know why it weighs so much. It was discovered at an accelerator at Chicago, the Tevatron, in 1995. So this is another question that we have. What is the origin of these particle masses? So that was about matter. What about forces? Well, this is the second question we can ask. What are the forces that hold the universe together? Well, today we know that there are four forces. Everyone knows gravity. You see an apple falling. Uh, everyone knows the electromagnetic force. If you rub your, your head uh, with a, a balloon, you'll get static. You can stick it to the wall. That's the electromagnetic force. And then there are two nuclear forces. There's the strong force that binds the quarks together in the nucleus. And there's the weak, elect uh, the weak radioactive force that is responsible, for example, for radioactivity. Now, do you actually see these nuclear forces? Well, yes, you do. If you look at the, the sun burning, while well, you're seeing the strong force and the weak force interacting. Without them, we wouldn't have the sun shining. And you can also see the nuclear forces, of course, at the McMaster Nuclear Reactor, which I believe it's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. So these are all real things. Now, one thing that we've learned that's very interesting is these forces are actually carried by particles. So, for example, the electromagnetic force is carried by something called a photon, the particle of light. There's, there's actually a little particle that's exchanged. That's how you can imagine a force of an interaction between two particles. Imagine someone throwing a baseball, and that's the exchange of the photon. That's the electromagnetic force. And similarly, for the other forces, the strong force has something we call the gluon, which is a bit of a strange name, but that's the name for the particle that holds the strong force. And the weak force is carried by something called the W and Z. And we think gravity is carried by a graviton, but it's not quite a definitive uh, uh, measurement yet. So those are the forces. Now, they have different strengths. So people have tried to unify the different forces. So going back to Newton, this was the first, perhaps, example of unifying the forces. Newton's one, one big advance was to say that gravity is universal, that the same force that's holding you to the Earth, the same force that makes an apple fall, uh, is the force that holds the moon around the Earth, that holds the Earth around the sun. Uh, it's a universal force, gravity. And a second example of unification of the forces was uh, Maxwell, 
who found out that electricity and magnetism are actually two sides of the same coin. They're the same force. Uh, so that is one of the milestones in unifying the forces. But when we say unify, well, they have different strengths. So which one of these is stronger? Is gravity stronger or is electromagnetism stronger? Well, we can do an experiment. Here's a, here's a bolt from the Atlas experiment at CERN, but it's, it's a spare, don't worry. Nothing is it's gonna fall apart. And it's, it's a big, heavy thing. So right now, gravity of the whole Earth is pulling on this bolt, and we can take a little magnet, and well, which is gonna win? Well, we're pulling up against the whole Earth, so that's just telling you that electromagnetism is stronger than gravity. Now, you might think gravity is strong, but it's actually a weak force. It's just that it's adding up over the whole Earth. That's why it seems to be strong. But it is, it is much weaker than electromagnetism. And here you can see a little table of the four forces, the strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity, and their relative strength. So here we've written that the strong force, let's say, has a strength of one, the electromagnetic force is weaker, the weak force, again, much weaker, and then a tiny, tiny gravitational force. And you remember, these are the particles that I talked about that carry the different forces, and those particles actually have a mass, which is another question that we'll try and answer. You know, the particle of light is massless, the photon, but the, the weak particles, the W and Z, actually are very, very massive, you know, 80 or 90 times the proton mass. So why all these different numbers? Why are they not the same? I mean, depending on these forces, it, it determines the size of atoms, the size of molecules, the size of us. So it's, it's quite an interesting question to ask. Can you unify these forces? Now, this is a question, of course, that Einstein pursued in the last years of his life. Can you unify these forces into some sort of model altogether? Actually, he didn't know of all the forces at that time. He was trying to unify gravity and the electromagnetic force, but now we know about the weak and strong forces. Can they unify at some high energy? And that was his dream. So this idea of unifying forces, you could imagine, is a bit like cooking soup. So at a very low energy, when it's cold, soup is sort of lumpy and, and you know, not uniform then you heat it up and it can become more uniform. So that's the idea, a bit of an accelerator, that you try and probe things at very high energy and you try and unify the different forces into some sort of common, common uh, original force. Now, how can you do that? Uh, that was the picture, but how can you actually do it uh, in a real experiment? Well, here you see three of the forces. This is their strength. Well, it's actually one over their strength. You see the strong force the weak force and the electromagnetic force. And what we've learned is that as you go to higher and higher energies, the strengths of those forces change. And in fact, if you extrapolate up to a very, very high energy scale, so these are the measured values, if you just extend the lines, well, they don't cross. They don't unify. There's no grand unification based on all the measurements we have today. Um, so it, well, you could imagine two lines cross, but to get three lines, to cross, it doesn't work. But there are models that people can come up with where you add in a little bit of new physics, physics that we might be able to look for at the Large Hadron Collider, like supersymmetry that we'll talk about. And it turns out if you add that in, the forces actually do cross, more or less at a very high energy point. So this is perhaps the first uh, hint that we're on the right track towards unifying the different forces uh, if we could find supersymmetry, uh, which we'll talk about later, that would be a major milestone for the Large Hadron Collider. So, let's talk about the Large Hadron Collider. So it's located, as you heard from Cliff, at CERN. So this is an aerial view. You can see Lake Geneva, you can see the airport. Of course, you don't actually see the ring when you're in the plane. The ring is 100 meters underground, but it's just drawn on here for, uh, for illustration. CERN is this lab here in this triangle, so it's quite a large laboratory. It was founded in 1954. It's the largest particle physics lab in the world, and uh, it has really become a magnet for scientists uh, in particle physics. So this shows you how people all across the world are working at CERN, so it's really become a global laboratory. You see people from Canada, the United States, South America, Africa, of course a huge European contingent, uh, Asia, and uh, even Australia. Uh, so there are people from all over the world, uh, you know, they're working in their own labs, they're, they're uh, building their component or they're, they're uh, uh, 
uh, designing something or working with industry to build something of the experiment, but then it's exported and brought all together to assemble the experiments at CERN, uh, and then the people from those countries can actually operate it with the accelerators. So we'll talk a bit about that. This is the age distribution of people at CERN. So they're young people. Uh, there are probably a few Nobel Prize winners up here in the 70s and 80s as well. So it's also known for the World Wide Web. Has, has anyone here not used the World Wide Web? Okay, good. So it was invented at CERN. Most people don't know this, but it was uh, invented as a system of communication in the 90s to share information amongst particle physics experiments. And uh, you see below here, you see Kofi Annan, who was uh, giving an award to one of the inventors from CERN, Tim Berners-Lee. And uh, that was in 2003 in Geneva. And in the upper right, you see the very first website. So this was a computer at CERN. That was the very first website, the basic design of the first browser. All of that was done there. In fact, in, in the beginning, people would, would almost laugh. They'd say, oh, is your document on the web? And people really didn't know in the 90s what this was going to become. In fact, here's the document at CERN which was first proposing the World Wide Web. So this is the actual document. And uh, you can see little diagrams how they propose this sort of interconnection of information. And the reviewer of the document said, well, it's vague, but it's interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> there are other things that CERN has become famous for, and this is uh, shots uh, from an upcoming film, Angels and Demons. Uh, so you may have heard of, of this person. He's playing a, um, a companion to a typical CERN physicist. Most of what's in the story is, is just pure fantasy. Almost everything is pure fantasy, but it's, of course, Dan Brown is a very good storyteller, so uh, it's probably uh, going to be an interesting film. And actually, they were visiting CERN uh, just uh, two weeks ago, so they were taking uh, promotional pictures, uh, went down to look at the experiments. So if you want to see really what's true and false, you can look at this website, the CERN website, and it'll tell you a bit more about the truth uh, behind it. But anyway, it's amusing. So this is the CERN website, sorry, this is the CERN uh, 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 layout. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is this ring, 100 meters underground. Uh, you see four different experiments. You see how it crosses the Swiss-French border. You see the lakes and the mountains in the distance. Here is the Atlas experiment, where Canada is, is a big contributor. We'll talk about that. And there are also four other experiments that we'll mention. So. The LHC is this, is this giant ring that's 27 kilometers in circumference. It's actually using the same tunnel that a previous collider, the large electron-positron collider, used to be running there. It was run for uh, about 11 years until it was essentially pushed to its limit. Uh, the LHC is a much, much higher energy collider. But for example, that resonance showing you the three families, that was something that came out of, out of the LEP collider. Uh, the LHC has something like 25 years of R&D behind it. Uh, there are about 10,000 scientists all around the world who have been working on it, uh, and it's certainly the largest scientific instrument that's ever been built. Now, how does an accelerator actually work? Well, you could imagine a, a battery. Let's say it's a, it's a one-volt battery. Usually it's one and a half volt. Uh, but let's say it's a one-volt battery, and you could accelerate a proton with that battery just because of the charge positive and negative charge, and you call that one electron volt because it's got the charge of one on it. Well, the LHC would be like 14 trillion batteries if you could string them all together uh, because that's the energy, 14 TV of the colliding beams when it's running. Of course, you don't use 14 trillion batteries. You use something different. So accelerators actually first came into being uh, in science with the discovery of the electron. Remember, we talked about the discovery of the electron a little over 100 years ago. So that was Thomson uh, with a little accelerator that allowed him to discover this particle. He could accelerate an electron and find out it's really a little particle with a specific charge and mass to it. Now, it used to be you could say that everyone had an accelerator in their home if you had an old-style television set. Probably now everyone has a fancy flat-screen TV. But in the old days, this television set was really the same model as an accelerator. 
So that uh, was something that was very common. There are actually about 10,000 that order accelerators around the world in many different applications, medical applications and so on. But they really began with searching for particles. Now, how are we going to use the accelerator at CERN? Well, you can, you can go back to Einstein's equation. Everyone knows E equals mc squared. Now the accelerator at the LHC will collide beams of protons together and you can use the energy of that collision to make particles, to make new particles, to search for new particles like for example, the particles of supersymmetry that might unify the different forces. And this is actually a simulation of particles being measured in the atlas detector from a collision and then being stopped in the different parts of the detector and we measure the event. So let's see if this is going to work. The LHC is actually not just one machine on its own, but it's got a whole chain to it. And we'll see if this works. So you see, that's the accelerator chain. It's injecting into a larger accelerator, and then all of that goes into the LHC. Of course, these would be circulating at the speed of light, but uh, that shows you the, the basic kinematics. Well, almost the speed of light, about 99%. Uh, well, 99.9999% the speed of light. So that's, that's the injector chain. Let's see if it goes on to the next one. So then, how do you actually keep particles in the beam? See if it'll go. One second. Yeah, okay. So the thing is when the, the particles collide, you know, there are thousands of bunches of protons. Most of the time they just pass through each other. There are only a few collisions. So you want to keep reusing it, recycling it. So you keep it in this ring of an accelerator. Don't worry, this is the last equation in the talk. No more equations. But the point is that when particles are turning around in a circle, they lose energy. And the larger the radius, the less energy they lose. The other thing is the larger the mass, the less energy they lose. So you want to use heavy particles. That's why you want to use something like a proton and a very, very large radius. That's why you end up with this 27 kilometer ring in circumference. Now the magnets that are bending the protons in the LHC are a little bit like a sportsman holding a very heavy weight. So if you have a very, very powerful magnet, you can bend the particles around in the ring. And the magnets that are used in the LHC are something like this. Let's make sure it works. One second. Right. So this is one of the bending magnets of the LHC. This was actually the last one as it was being delivered to CERN. There were 1,232, as you can see. Uh, these were all made in industry, uh, something like 15 meters long. And we can see a bit more of it on the next page. So this is the last LHC magnet as it was being lowered down into the LHC tunnel in 2007. Uh, and this is a schematic of the LHC, of just one LHC dipole magnet. So what do you see? Well, first of all, there are two holes here for the LHC beam, so actually two proton beams are going through one magnet and then to carry enough current to bend the proton beams you use superconducting cables. So these are cables that are uh, able to carry a high current with low resistance only if you run at a very low temperature. So the cables are actually just around those two beams. If you used you know the copper cabling you have at home you'd end up with huge cables well larger than I can stretch my arms but by using superconductors, you're able to make very small uh, cables. Now, the only way that's going to work is if you cool it down to a liquid helium temperature, so about minus 270 degrees Celsius. So in the end, the LHC becomes the coldest ring on Earth, and that's how it's able to carry this huge current. So this is an example. Okay, it's 12,000 amps of current you can carry in the superconductors. Here's a technician doing the final connections between two LHC dipole magnets. And there again I mention how it's the coldest ring on Earth. Now, as Cliff Burgess mentioned, Canada has built part of the LHC. So here you see part of the so-called um, uh, cleaning magnets in the LHC. As the beam goes around, it's not just a perfect, perfect line of protons. It has, let's say, a halo around it 
and some of that you have to clean up, clean up, otherwise you won't have a very, very good focused beam. So these are magnets, about 50 magnets of the LHC that were designed with scientists from Canada at Triumph at our National Particle Physics Lab in, in Vancouver, together with CERN scientists. Uh, they were then manufactured in industry by Alstom in, uh, in Quebec, uh, tested and then sent to CERN. And they're now, this is a picture of the Canadian magnets all installed underground in the LHC. So it's all completed, it's all working. If you look carefully, you can see a little triumph symbol on that magnet. So Canada has built part of the LHC. This is the order of some uh, tens of millions of dollars that we've invested in the science and the technicians and in industry building it. So let's go back to the experiments. I mentioned that there are four experiments at the LHC. Uh, so we'll mainly talk about the Canadian involvement on the ATLAS experiment. It is a general purpose experiment. It's designed to try and find any sort of physics discovery. It's, uh, it's designed to find it in many different ways. Uh, but of course there's a competitor which is called CMS, the compact muon solenoid. Uh, that's also a general purpose detector. Uh, and then there are two other dedicated experiments. One called the ALICE experiment which will look at collisions of heavy ions when instead of putting protons you put ions, you could put lead for example in the LHC and look at what's called a quark gluon plasma, how the quarks could become free very briefly. Um, there's also an experiment called LHCB which is going to study uh, the difference between matter and antimatter. So this is one question that goes back to the Big Bang. We understand or we believe in the Big Bang that you had equal quantities of matter and antimatter produced at the same time. Now if that's true, why, why are we here? Why was everything not just, uh, let's say, annihilated? Well, it turns out there is, let's say, a, a preference, it seems, to produce matter. Very, very tiny preference. So that's, uh, that's one thing the LHCB experiment will study. So that's all that I will mention about the LHCB. We'll have a look now at, at the ATLAS experiment. So the basic, this is the basic uh, schematic of how a detector in particle physics works. So this is the inside of the detector, this is the outside, and there are different particles you could produce in a collision. You could produce photons, particles of light, which won't leave any track in a tracking chamber, but they will start to leave a shower in energy deposits in an electromagnetic calorimeter. Uh, there could be electrons that you produce that'll leave a track, will leave a shower in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Uh, there could be muons that'll just leave a sort of constant line of energy throughout the whole detector. Pions, protons, these are particles made of quarks. Neutrons, which won't leave a track, but then will shower in the calorimeters. And it's calorimeters, energy measuring devices, that Canada has built. So here is now the real detector in, in the scale of Atlas. It is 22 meters high. It's 46 meters long. It's one and a half blue whales in size, if you want to use that scale. And Canada has built parts of the calorimeters at either end. So the two proton beams are brought into focus here at the interaction point. And then uh, 40 million times a second, they're made to collide. And we have to measure the energy of every collision and decide if it's interesting, do we keep it or, or do we not keep that event, do we reject it? You can see the scale of two people here uh, working on Atlas. Uh, of course, the other components were built uh, all over the world. The total mass of Atlas is about 7,000 tons, so that's as much steel as went into the Eiffel Tower and more. Uh, it has also got about a 100 megapixel camera inside, so maybe today you can buy a 10 megapixel camera. Well, Atlas is 100 megapixels, and there are over 3,000 kilometers of cables that go into the readout of the detector. This also shows you an idea of the scale of Atlas. So as I said, it's 92 meters underground, uh, which is the height of the Peace Tower in Ottawa, and the size is roughly one of the wings of the Parliament buildings. Now this is a picture, this is a family photo of the Atlas collaborators. So this is about two and a half thousand people, not all of them are there, but again, just on the Atlas experiment. Uh, again, from all over the world, about 169 different universities and institutions 
uh, from 37 different countries. So the Canadian component includes these universities that you see here. So uh, 10 universities together with the Triumph National Laboratory. Uh, it is now reaching about 150 people across Canada that uh, work on the experiment. Some people have been working uh, almost two decades in the Atlas Canada group. And as I mentioned, the calorimeters, the energy measuring devices, uh, which we'll see in a moment, are the, the major contributions. You know, these are 100 ton detectors that were built, designed in Canada, and have now all been installed. Uh, it has many uh, graduate students, many undergraduate students, and about 43 uh, university faculty and lab people working. And here are just a few snapshots of some of the people uh, across Canada that have been working on the Atlas experiment. So many, many different people all across the country. So here's a picture of one of the calorimeters. Remember that I mentioned that Canada has built, so it's an energy measuring device. So you see a little slice of it here, a prototype, and you imagine a particle from a collision going in like this. And these are long, long layers of lead, which will start to stop the particle and make it shower. So here's a simulation of a shower going through. And this, each layer is filled with uh, argon gas. So argon is a gas that's just in the air we can breathe, but it's cooled down so that it becomes a liquid. And as the particle goes through, it showers into this gas. It splits the gas up into charged parts. There are high voltage plates in between each of these little lines and the charged gas drifts to these plates and you get a little pulse, you get a signal. And the height of that signal tells you how much energy each particle uh, was that was going into the calorimeter. So that's the basic functioning of a calorimeter. And let's see if we can go to show you what it looks like. There it is. So this is one of the two end cap calorimeters that was built in Canada. So this is about a 100 ton object you know, a person is on a little scale down here, and you see this liquid argon calorimeter technology uh, all in this ring. And that's sitting at one of the two ends of the Atlas detector. You can see this is where the beam line would be along the center. So there it is. This is a photo I took of one of the Canadian calorimeters being transported at CERN. So it was brought in pieces to CERN and then assembled on that wheel you just saw. And here it is on a flatbed truck being brought to the Atlas experiment. Here it is now a view from the top of this tunnel that goes down into Atlas, and this 100 ton calorimeter is being lowered down into Atlas. And here it is finally assembled with uh, a hadronic calorimeter that we mentioned earlier, uh, around it as a ring that's being brought in to the Atlas experiment. Again, the beam line would be this point along here. The beam line would be something like that. A few more pictures. So, of course, um, we had to dig the tunnel, the cavern, for the Atlas experiment itself. And that was starting around the year 2000. So this was actually digging out the tunnel where we're going to put the experiment. You can see there was a lot of civil engineering that went on. This is excavating further and dig digging out this tunnel 100 meters underground. There, they're putting the reinforced concrete floor into Atlas. And, uh, and completing the basic structure of it. And this is what it looked like in 2004. This was a, a typical work day. I, I took this picture when I was working with some, I guess they're French and American and Italian and many other groups, testing some of the calorimeters as they're being assembled. And the funny thing is you're, you're 100 meters underground, but you're still working at a height. So if you, if you don't like working at heights, and I don't like working at heights, uh, you still end up uh, having vertigo. It's a strange thing. Um, there's a picture of another Canadian working underground on a laptop. Here's a bit later in 2005 where they've completed a large part of what's called the, well, the magnet spectrometer, the muon spectrometer. There you see one guy working bravely away. He, he does have a, a harness, but he's working away. Again, he must not be afraid of heights. Here you see two shots you know, they talk about Atlas being like a ship in a bottle. You see one of these large superconducting magnets, so-called barrel toroid magnets, which uh, is so big it couldn't be lowered horizontally down the access shaft. It had to go down at an angle, and those eight were assembled here, and that gives 
part of the bending magnetic field, you need an atlas to measure the curvature and the momentum of particles. And we'll see another picture of that in a minute. Here's on the right, another example of the scale of some of the detectors. These are called the big wheels in Atlas, so you can see people working on them. And these are to measure muons that might come out from a collision in Atlas. So this would be the beam line. Atlas is actually deep inside here, and they could measure particles coming out like that. This is one of the famous pictures. This is almost looking, if you were a proton, down into Atlas. It shows you the completion of these eight superconducting magnets and the calorimeter system is slowly being lowered into the center. And as you can see, one person can assemble it all. <laughs> We've also had a lot of uh, distinguished visitors uh, to Atlas. As it was being completed, Stephen Hawking came for a visit and uh, the Black Eyed Peas, some of the younger people in the audience may know. Uh, they were not there at the same time though. Now, before we had BEAM in ATLAS, one thing we wanted to do was to test it with cosmic rays. So the most famous cosmic rays are the northern lights. You know, these are particles coming from the sun and showering in the Earth's upper atmosphere. But they can be coming from many different sources. They could be coming from an active galactic nucleus, from a, uh, a star, from something that's emitting particles. In fact, all over the universe, cosmic rays are being produced and they shower in the Earth's atmosphere, and then you get a few particles that come down to Earth, typically muons, the ones that survive. And we'll see if this works. This shows you a little demonstration of a cosmic ray detector at CERN. We'll see if it works. So if you can see it, there are little lines coming down between charged plates. These are real muons coming down in cosmic rays. These are particles that are hitting us right now, actually, as we speak. So they're going on all the time, and uh, it's a constant background that nature gives us. So let's see if we can go on. So how do we use these cosmic rays? Let's see if we can go to the next one. So, okay, first of all, this looks a bit complicated, but it's just the scale of the energy of cosmic rays that are produced in nature, and this is the rate of them. And notice this is a logarithmic scale, so it's powers of 10 at each point. Now, the previous accelerator that used to be the highest energy accelerator, the Tevatron at Chicago, the one that found the top quark, was running somewhere here at this energy. The LHC will run somewhere down here, but compared to cosmic rays, actually nature can produce energies that are many billions of times more energetic. But uh, what we can do with them while we're waiting for the LHC to turn on is to measure signals in the detector. So these are real events, real cosmic rays that were measured in Atlas. In this case, these yellow points show you the energy measured in the calorimeters as a particle goes through. So what are we going to do with Atlas? Well, you remember we went through the standard model of the quarks. We went through the forces, which are carried by the different particles, but there's one missing piece to the standard model, and that is this Higgs boson that you've probably heard of. So what is this Higgs boson? Well, it's missing, first of all. It's named after Peter Higgs. It is, it is what's called a, a scalar particle, a spin zero particle. And all that that means, it's like a number everywhere in space. So an example of a scalar field could be a temperature map. Imagine there's a number everywhere in space. Now, if this were the Higgs field, in reality, this, you know, the Higgs field is what we think gives particles mass. And if this were really the Higgs field, this would be a problem because it would mean if you were to travel, let's say, from Montreal to Vancouver, you'd become lighter because the numbers are actually lower. Now, some people might like that, but the Higgs field itself should be the same number everywhere. So this is just a rough example. Now, this, another way of thinking of this Higgs field is to imagine a room of journalists chattering away, and then in walks an important politician, in this case it's Margaret Thatcher, and the journalists all cluster around the politician and give that politician mass. They're sort of, uh, let's say, suppressing their movement. Another way of thinking of the Higgs particle itself is to imagine someone calling out a rumor at the entrance to the room, and then people start talking and they cluster not around a person, but around this rumor. And that's a way of thinking of the Higgs particle itself. 
Another way you could think about it of the Higgs field, imagine this is a poor Argonaut and being blocked by the Higgs field of the tie cats and he's acquiring a mass and he's not going not to get through. He's interacting with the Higgs field. Now, this is a bit complicated, but it shows you the state of our knowledge of searching for the Higgs particle. So this is, on this scale, the mass of the Higgs particle in units of a proton mass, GeV. And this yellow region is the region where we've excluded it. We've ruled it out based on all the previous experiments. So it's not going to be in this region. It's more massive. It's above 114 GeV, 114 proton masses. There's a second curve that shows you, let's say, a best fit, a least squared fit to what the data, other data tells us the Higgs should lie. It actually tells us it should be very light. So there's a bit of a, a conflict here. It tells us it should be already maybe in the region that we've excluded. Now, it could be, it could be out a little bit higher, just depending on the measurements. But it's telling us that it should be very light. We should actually be able to find it at the LHC or else rule it out. Now, how could you do that? Well, here is a little simulation of two protons from the LHC beams colliding. So you see piles of quarks and gluons in each proton at 7 TV. And then imagine each one emits a quark. They radiate a W and they fuse to form a Higgs, which can then decay into the Z particle. You remember the electroweak particle? And then it can decay. And you'll see the sign of that in your detector. Now, that's a very, very weak process, a very, very rare process. So for each of these interesting events, you'll get thousands and billions and billions of background events. So it's, it's not just looking for a needle in one haystack. Someone said it's like looking for a needle in a thousand haystacks. But you can do it. So this is an example of what a Higgs production would be at the LHC. This is the so-called golden channel. So if you've got very good eyesight, maybe you can see the Higgs in there. But actually, you just see lots of tracks, lots of background. But if you filter it out, you can see the Higgs decaying into four muons. So it is possible to find. This is also another picture of a simulation of a Higgs discovery in Atlas. You can see a Higgs being produced and then decaying into different electrons and then two muons that go out through the muon chambers. And if we run for many, many years and collect lots of these events, we would hope to see an excess, a collection, a bump, you know, just like a bell curve of events clustering at the mass of the Higgs. And there, that's what you see in blue in the simulation. And in background is the green. So that would be the smoking gun for saying, yes, we have discovered the Higgs particle. But again, this is a simulation. We have to turn the machine on. <laughs> now, all the data we're going to collect is just enormous. You remember we talked about finding the needle in the haystack. You can compare the data that's generated by Atlas running at 40 million times a second to giving everyone in the world a cell phone and having them talk at the same time. It's just an enormous amount of data. Now, we filter that in three stages on the detector itself. But even then, the amount of data that we write out to tape would, uh, would stack. Let's say if you were to write it to DVDs, you'd make a stack of DVDs the height of the CN Tower every year. So it's an enormous amount of data that's being written out. And the way to solve this problem is to actually analyze it all over the world. We spread the data out over a worldwide computing grid. So you see it's centered at CERN and then spread out all over the world in Asia, in Canada, in the United States. And really tens of thousands of computers will be used and already are being tested to analyze the data that comes out of the LHC. Remember I talked about the cosmic ray data? Well, we're already testing this, this computing grid in Canada, transferring millions of cosmic ray events from CERN to our tier one center at Triumph, and then analyzing the data in the, in the Western and Eastern Canadian uh, tier computing centers. So we're already working at it. Now, let's go back to our question. We said, what is the universe made of? And we answered it by saying, everything is made of quarks and electrons. Everything that we can see is made of quarks and electrons. Actually, that's only 5% of the universe. There's a lot more than meets the eye. And, oh, this isn't quite perfect, but this is supposed to show you the budget of the universe. And, well, I'm afraid the picture didn't work out. But the point is that we only know about 5% of what the universe is made of. 
all the stars, all the galaxies, everything we can see is really only about 5%. And there's something else, it's about 25% called dark matter, and there's another 70% called dark energy. And maybe this dark matter is something we could also discover at the LHC. Now, just quickly, there's a lot of evidence for this dark matter. This is one example. This is a, a galaxy. If you look at how the stars are spinning around the galaxy, they're going much, much faster than just gravity should tell you. There's something else there. This is the expected speed of the stars as you go out from the center, and this is the measured speed. So there's something that isn't stars, that isn't planets, that's holding these stars and making them spin much faster and interacting through gravity. And one solution that we have that we could search for at the LHC is something called supersymmetry. So here you see all the particles of the standard model that we talked about earlier. And in supersymmetry, we actually have partners to all of these particles in a sort of mirror world. Now, these are not particles you can see every day, but if you have enough energy in an accelerator, you might be able to produce them and discover this whole mirror, wor mirror world of particles and one of those particles could be the dark matter particle. How would you actually make it in the LHC? Well, this is a simulation of two protons colliding and making a long, complicated chain of particles. But what stays in the end are these two candidates for the dark matter particle, something called the neutralino, a little neutral, stable particle that escapes your detector. Now, how are you going to measure something that doesn't leave any energy? Well. You do get some energy from the other particles in the event. And what it would look like, you see right here. So this is a simulation looking down the beam line of the LHC. You see the energy of particles that are stable, that are normal. And then you see missing energy from these dark matter particles. So if we saw a huge excess of particles with missing energy, that's this sort of red curve in the simulation, compared to what the standard model predicts, if we start to see such an excess, Maybe we're on the road to discovering supersymmetry. So let's go on. So in the last few slides, as you know, we were preparing for the first beam in the LHC. This was in June of last summer when we were closing the Large Hadron Collider. This is actually an atlas closing the beam pipe. And then this was on September 10th when the first beam, so this is a the schematic of the Large Hadron Collider, the first beam was injected first just partway around the ring. And you can see it worked the first time. You can see in a, in a pickup, that's the actual beam being registered. It, it went all the way up to that point. So that got people very excited. So they kept going. They tried it in the other direction. Remember, you want to have beams circulating in both directions so they can collide. And there you see it worked again. They stopped the beam with a, what's called a collimator just to make sure that it doesn't, uh, doesn't damage anything. They went farther. They went halfway around the ring. And then they got very excited in the control room, the Large Hadron Collider. You see all the cameras there. And they got it all the way around the ring on both directions. They managed to circulate a beam like this and circulate a beam like that. So that was really an exciting moment. There were people that were crying, actually, when they saw this work. One, uh, one Canadian person said it felt as if you'd been pregnant for 20 years. <laughs> and finally, you give birth. Was it a lady? Yes, <laughs> yes. So you managed to get the beam around once. Well, that's no good. You want it to circulate millions and millions of times. So there is a system, a radio frequency system, that gives the beam a little kick of energy each time it goes around. And here you see the first time they attempted it to work. Each line is a little circle, a circuit time uh, each time it, it goes around the ring, you see it make a little bump. Well, it didn't work. The first time, it didn't work. Now, OK, the beam was lost. Then they tried again. They adjusted it. And this time, the beam became defocused, and it didn't work. They tried a third time, and the beam sort of wandered off. They couldn't synchronize it. Now, don't forget, they'd expected to spend weeks doing this. And they did all this on the first day. And at the end of the day, they actually got the beam to be stable. It was circulating around the LHC millions and millions of times. It was just really an exciting moment. It, they, could, they, called a, it, they called it a capture. They could keep the beam working perfectly. So it meant that uh, the, the LHC works. It was very exciting. Now, 
Another test they did was to take just a single beam, not beams colliding yet, but a single beam, and fire it into a, a closed collimator. It's about 100 meters away from the Atlas experiment, and then just measure signals in the detector to show that it's alive, that we can see energy in the calorimeter. So these, these uh, blue square or green squares are me energy measured in the calorimeter, and the outside is the muon system. That's the beam direction. And this is looking out in the beam direction. So that was the so-called first beam event in Atlas. And again, people were very excited to see that in the Atlas control room. And there's another view, again, of particles going through Atlas. And it was very exciting. Now, of course, there was uh, a problem that occurred uh, on the 19th of September. And you can read in the report that in one sector, really the last sector, the last piece to be tested, the LHC, there was a short that occurred. That shows here up in sector 3, 4. And it was a short in one of these connections between the different dipole magnets. And it caused a loss of helium in that sector. It was uh, enough that it damaged uh, several of the magnets. And it required the uh, accelerator to stop, to be warmed up, which takes something like three to four weeks. And they had to go in and investigate it. So that's, that was the state at the end of last year. Now, uh, just two days ago, there was a summary report on the repairs on this. Now, the repairs are going extremely well. All of the, already they're installing replacement magnets underground. And there's a so-called quench protection system that's designed so that this couldn't happen again. And that's being installed. What this gives us is a planned restart of the LHC uh, sometime in September of this year. And we hope to have the LHC running with colliding beams one or two months after that. Now, normally they would shut down in the winter, but exceptionally they're going to run over the winter uh, for something like an 11th month, 11th month run and at a high energy. So that really will give us a lot of data over next year and hopefully, as they say, it'll blow away the competition. <laughs> so what is the road ahead? Well, we hope that the Higgs Road is ahead. This was actually a photo taken in eastern Canada that will be on the way to discovering the Higgs. And this was actually Peter Higgs, the first Higgs seen in Atlas as he visited the detector. <laughs> so in the last few minutes, we have a film which I hope works. It didn't work the last time I tried, but we'll try now. So we'll first zoom in to the CERN lab. So you see Lake Geneva. You see. In a 27 kilometer underground ring near Geneva, protons are accelerated to near the speed of light and collided. Here at the CERN laboratory, scientists can recreate the conditions of the universe immediately after the Big Bang. The huge Atlas detector, which studies these collisions, took several years to assemble, but through animation, we can watch it in a few minutes. <laughs> Throughout much of the Atlas detector, there is an intense magnetic field. This is produced by passing current through about 80 kilometers of superconducting cables housed within a large toroidal structure. This enables Atlas to maintain one of the world's largest volumes of intense magnetic field. It is important to measure the energies of particles which pass through the detector. This is done by a device known as a calorimeter. Atlas has several types which are arranged as barrels placed in both the center and at the ends of the detector. The 3,000 ton tile calorimeter is composed of steel and a special material which lights up when particles pass through. The tile calorimeter surrounds a second calorimeter which consists of lead bathed in liquid argon which is cooled to minus 180 degrees Celsius. This is known as the electromagnetic calorimeter 
Outside of the calorimeter, there is a further component which measures the trajectory of charged particles called muons that reach the outermost layers. The surface area of this component, the muon detector, is around the size of several football fields. Now, let's look inside the detector. Here we can see in more detail the pieces of individual components. The tile calorimeter. The electromagnetic calorimeter. So those are pieces built in Canada. the transition radiation tracker, and the silicon devices. That's in a typical reality, graduate student. A scientist would not be allowed to walk through the open detector, but in this case, it illustrates the sheer scale of the Atlas detector. Now, we can finally witness the Atlas detector measuring the particles from the colliding protons. A typical collision produces many hundreds of particles, and each component of the Atlas detector is necessary to build a full picture of the collision. If you want to know how it all works, don't miss Episode 2, The Particles Strike Back. So finally, in conclusion, we can look at what we might hope to see one day in the Hamilton Spectator in the future. <laughs> well, okay, of course, you're probably looking at the first headline. Obama solves the global financial crisis and brings world peace. But what scientists would hope one day to see is perhaps a headline that says, the mystery of dark matter has been solved with a Large Hadron Collider. Thank you.